Okay, so we've got microfilaments. We'll also see when we talk about cell division, these are the proteins that divide the cytoplasm of a cell. They're responsible for cytokinesis in animal cells. So microfilaments, then we have intermediate filaments. These also give the cell its overall shape. You can see the green structures are stained intermediate filaments. They're made out of a different protein subunit. They're made out of a keratin protein, kind of twisted around. This almost looks like a, uh, like a really thick cable that's just a bunch of wires that are braided together to make a really strong cable-like structure. And what these, maybe instead of thinking of them as a cable, have you, have you seen like when they're pouring a driveway or something like that, they don't just pour the concrete down, they'll put a bunch of rebar down and then they'll pour concrete over the rebar and that rebar acts as a, a, a fiber that holds all of the, the concrete patches together. The intermediate filaments do the same thing to your cell. They act as anchor points for organelles to adhere to so that they're not sloshed around. Then we have these microtubules. We can see they're the largest in diameter, but they're hollow tubes, so they're, they're not strong. In fact, if we wanted to think about which ones are the strongest, intermediate filaments are the strongest just due to the structure. These are the weakest. They're hollow tubes, and each subunit, these are tubulin subunits, and there are two parts, an alpha and beta part. We'll get to those later. Uh, in videos that we will see, these microtubules can spontaneously form, and we'll see that these form when the, the nucleus goes to divide its chromosomes. Spindle fibers are made out of these microtubules, and we can see they grow uh, and they can grab onto chromosomes and they can be ripped apart and, and pull chromosomes in opposite directions. So these are kind of dynamic tubes that are forming and then breaking apart. These are much more stable proteins. Here's what I was just saying with words. Uh, intermediate filaments and microfilaments are going to help maintain the cell's shape. They give it an overall structure. Uh, we said microfilaments and microtubules can both act as roadways uh, for things like the chromosomes being pulled from one part of the cell to the next, or organelles that are trying to move from one side of the cell to the next. You know, if I'm a mitochondria over here and the chloroplast just moved over there and is producing sugars, well, I may move over here to get closer to those sugars. And I would want to follow one of those microtubules or microfilaments to get over there. Uh, talking about how cells stitch together. I'm going to turn the lights back on for a second. And there are three types of cell junctions between animal cells that we need to know. And we can see all of them right here. Uh, tight junctions, desmosomes, and gap junctions are three types of cell connections between animal cells. And is there any way that I can ask you to hop up here and just meet me on the side and, well, no, we, we need to actually film this, but you, you look great. Come on, hop up here. You've got a zipper and that's what we really need. So um, your, the two sides of your jacket are going to represent the plasma membranes of two adjacent cells. And uh, these are gonna represent cells that line our small intestines. And I'll use the pointer. I'll try to be quick with this. If you were to eat a piece of food, the food would be going along the cells of your small intestines. And you wouldn't, you know, sometimes you hear like lettuce has been recalled because there's salmonella or, you know, there's some, something on the food that you eat. And you don't want particles that are on your food or bacteria that's on your food to be able to sneak in between these cells and then into the bloodstream without having to pass through the cytoplasm where there's all of the lysosomes and things that can break down bacteria cells before they get into the bloodstream. So to prevent things like bacteria that's on our food from sneaking between the cells that line our small intestines, there are cell connections that provide uh, an effective, a watertight seal between adjacent plasma membranes. They're just like the zippers that you have. So if you zip up the, the zipper that you have, that is, it's a connection point between every single place along those two membranes. So that if I'm a bacteria, I can't get through that zipper at all. 
that's one type of cell junction, but in other places, like the cells that connect the heart, for example, we want there to be some stretching in between those cells. So another type of cell junction are these desmosomes. They're like rivets or little spot welds, and the buttons on my shirt are a contrast to that. You can see how they're, they're held together in certain places, but it provides these little gaps or these spaces uh, where there is no connection. So the buttons represent desmosomes, the zipper represents tight junctions. Thank you for that. And then the only other cell, mem uh, cell junction that we need to see in animal cells are called gap junctions. And these are easy. They're like a hollow tube or a straw that connects the cytoplasm of one cell to the adjacent cell. So cytoplasm can freely flow from one cell into the next. So three types of cell junctions when we look at animal cells. And there's only one more we need to add when we talk about plant cells and it's that plasmodesmata. We've already introduced it. It behaves just like a gap junction does in animal cells. But a gap junction doesn't have to go through a cell wall. So this thing should look familiar. It is our phospholipid. We were talking about the fact that our membranes are made out of a double layer of these phospholipids, and they provided a selective pressure between molecules inside or outside of the cell. Here's the polar head. It wants to form hydrogen bonds with other polar molecules and the hydrophobic tails want to form those hydrophobic interactions with other hydrophobic tails. So they spun together uh, into this double layer where the tails formed this, this, I described it as a hydrophobic moat so that other nonpolar, if you were if you were nonpolar, you got along just fine in this layer. But if you were polar or if you were charged, you had difficulty crossing this membrane. Um, I described this as a fluid mosaic model. It's even here as a, described as a fluid mosaic model. But uh, there is a video that I wanted to show you. It was just on the previous slide that uh, I think does a good job of describing this, this fluid mosaic help if I had the sound on. of the inner cell and the harsh conditions of the outside world stands the cell's plasma membrane. As crucial as this barrier is, it's surprisingly flexible. Push it and watch it move. Poke hard enough and it might break and begin to regroup. The lipid molecules of the membrane naturally assemble in a double layer because their tails repel water as their heads attract it. Throw in some cholesterol and a few carbohydrates, and you have the basic structure of a plasma membrane. Within these lipid molecules, we also find different proteins, which do various things for the cell. For instance, they receive signals from the world outside, or they transport nutrients and waste. So nature composes the membrane with a combination or mosaic of different lipids, carbohydrates, and proteins. And these molecules are not stationary. They constantly move within the structure, fluidly changing their positions. The survival of all life rests on this veil of material. All right. So again, super old sound effects, but the good uh, video there, the moving phospholipids and how you can disturb them and they still just spontaneously rearrange in that uh, bilayer. All right, we compared integral proteins to peripheral proteins and our next step, since we just have talked about the structure of the membrane again, is to talk about how things cross this membrane. Uh, let's look at this picture for a second and I'm going to turn the light back on. Um, maybe it would be helpful if you could think with your, your brain uh, about this analogy. Let's, we're going to use this wall as our representation of a plasma membrane. Somewhat. We're going to do the best we can. Uh, and it, it will be helpful if instead of, you know, we've got the doors that are here. But instead of this wall being made out of uh, drywall or whatever it's made out of, imagine that this wall is a chain link fence like you'd see on the outside of a baseball field or a football field or something. So, you know, those chain link fences, you can see through them. 
if you were a mosquito or something, you could just fly right through the chain link fence like it wasn't here at all and you'd be out in the hallway. You wouldn't need to go through a door, but somebody like us, we're too big to fit through the little holes in a chain link fence, so we would need a gate. We would need this protein facilitator to let us out in the hallway. So I know there's not a chain link fence behind me, but just imagine if you close your eyes, let's imagine that, that this wall, except for the doors, is a chain link fence. And we're gonna see that some things can cross through that chain link fence easily, chain link fence being this plasma membrane, and other things are gonna require a protein channel like we would to get out in the hallway. <coughs> All right, there are notes on this, and like I said, I didn't bring them, but I can do one better, and that is I can fit all of this stuff into a, con well, concept map might be a strong word. Let's put a little chart up that helps us distinguish the different types of membrane transport. Can you see that color in the back of the room? Okay, we got enough juice left in that. Membrane transport, we can see all the different types on the board, but let's just first separate that into two, two pathways. There is one pathway that we're gonna to refer to as a passive type of transport. Two things we're gonna to need to know about passive transport, and then we're gonna compare that to active transport uh, there, there's two things we'll need to know about active transport. And, and maybe before we list the specific ones that are on the board, let's just talk about those two things that we need to remember that's going to be common about all the different types of passive transport. In all types of passive transport, no energy is going to be needed. So I'll say no energy required. Uh, and by energy, this is, this is always in the form of ATP. So no ATP required. And the reason that no ATP is required because in all cases of passive transport, these particles that we're talking about crossing a membrane are always going to be going from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. It could be glucose, it could be sodium, it could be water molecules. So I'm just gonna collectively just say particles move from high to low concentration. Anytime you're going from, from high to low concentration, this is what we would describe as going down our concentration gradient. Does anybody have a, well, we don't have a water bottle here, but Oh, it's okay. Let's just let's use this thought experiment right here. We don't have water. There's some cappuccino that's in this cup right here. It's about halfway full. There's more in the cup than there is outside. So if I were to tip this thing over, it would obviously spread out. It would go from high to low concentration. That would make a sticky mess. Another uh, example that's sometimes used is if I had somebody's perfume, I could put a couple of pumps of perfume in the corner of the room and we would see particles just spread out from high to low concentration. Maybe my favorite example is to go back whenever I was living in San Marcos and going to school there, I had an inner tube on my back porch and one of the favorite things for me to do at the end of the day of classes was to grab this inner tube and go put it into the water and as long as I was going following that water from high to low concentration, it didn't require any energy at all. It was very relaxing. You could just sit there and float downstream. Uh, I, you know, there's nothing against the, the laws of physics that would pr have prevented me from putting my inner tube in down under the, the interstate and then paddling my way upstream back towards my apartment. You can do that, but that's going to be going against the concentration gradient. And when you do that, it requires a lot of energy. A lot of work has to go into that. So in, in terms of cell work, it's always ATP. In active transport, we're going to see this requires lots of ATP, just like paddling upstream. So I'll say requires energy in the form of ATP. And the reason that it requires so much energy, we said, because you're swimming upstream. Particles are going to be moving from low to high concentration over here.
So particles move from low to high concentration. Okay. We're going to look at three different types of passive transport and two different types of active transport. I'll try and list them because some of them are up here already. You can see the slide has just called the first one diffusion. I'm going to list here simple diffusion, You can say diffusion or simple diffusion. Either one is fine. But we're going to contrast simple diffusion from the next type, what we're going to call facilitated diffusion. I mean, they're both passive transport. Both of them aren't going to require any energy. Both of them are going to involve particles going from high to low concentration. But there's a difference. Uh, and then the last thing we're going to put on this list down here, let's sneak in osmosis. It belongs under this category of passive transport. I'm drawing it in a blue color because we're going to learn it's specific to just water molecules. All right, uh, three types of passive transport. Let me at least introduce the two types of active transport. We're going to see the first type that we're going to call primary active transport. Primary active transport, sometimes uh, just written like this. Primary active transport. Uh, we're going to compare that to secondary active transport. Sometimes just drawn like this, secondary active transport. We already know uh, on this side that if we're talking about active transport, this is going to require ATP. Uh, particles are going to be going from low to high concentration. And that's going to be the case in primary active transport. We're going to see that this uses ATP. And the rest of it is obvious. It uses ATP to push these particles against their concentration gradient. But there's a trick down here. And this is what I'm hoping to get to today. Secondary active transporters don't use ATP. Instead, these secondary active transporters are going to rely on the ATP that's used up here at the primary active transporter. Uh, maybe the other thing that I can put uh, next to secondary active transporters is that most of these secondary active transporters tend to be co-transporters. That means two things are going to cross a membrane. Examples are going to include a sodium calcium exchange, a co-transporter. Uh, there's also a sodium glucose transporter. So it transports sodium and glucose. Have you ever been in one of those, uh, like a bank or like one of these big hotels that you walk into and the, the front of the door is like one of those turning doors with the, the different sections. And so, uh, you know, you can go in one side at the same time, somebody else is going out the other one. That's how all of these co-transporters work. They're like a, one of those doors with the different sections. And as one, one particle comes into the cell, another particle moves out. We'll, we'll look at a couple of examples of co-transporters. Let's get back to the slides. Everybody doing okay still? Okay. Uh, starting with passive transport. Here is an example of, well, not only passive transport because we can see particles going from an area of high concentration down towards an area of low concentration. It doesn't even tell us what these particles are. We can just see they're, they're going down their concentration gradient. They're spreading out. These happen to be crossing a membrane, so it qualifies as a type of membrane transport. Right, um, let's, let's maybe put a, an example up as a cell. I've got this space 
and I'm going to let this space just represent E. I'm going to give myself a little bit more room on this side to label some things. But let's let this represent our uh, outer membrane. And we've got our fluid inside the cell, our intracellular fluid, uh, and then we've got this fluid outside the cell, our extracellular fluid. There are, well, let's, let's list a couple of things. We're just talking about simple diffusion. And we said that this membrane earlier, I think this was one of the things we mentioned last time. If not, it was at some lecture earlier. We said this plasma membrane is selective. And there were two criteria that it selected on. Does anybody remember what those two, two criteria were for crossing this moat, this membrane? So polar has something to do with it, because polar is a slight charge. And then to, to think about our chain link fence analogy, remember if we're a tiny mosquito, we can just fly right through the chain link fence because we're small enough. Large things like us can't go through that, that chain link fence. We need a gate. We need some type of facilitator to get us out into the hallway. So plasma membrane separates based off of size and charge. So if we're small enough, we're going to be able to cross easily, but also if we don't have a charge. So size and charge have to be cleared if we're going to easily cross this membrane. So something like a oxygen gas molecule. Remember that oxygen gas, it's just two oxygens. Here they are. Uh, sharing electrons, and since it's just two oxygens doing a tug of war with one another, these electrons would be shared equally. So it's a nonpolar molecule. We said nonpolar molecules, since this entire membrane is made out of a nonpolar bilayer, things that are nonpolar can just cross the membrane all, all by themselves, as, as if they were a mosquito just flying right through this chain link fence. They're small enough. They don't have a charge, they're nonpolar, they can just move right in. So oxygen gas tends to diffuse, just by simple diffusion, right across the membrane into the cell. And remember that the cell is always is going through its own cell metabolic processes and it's producing a bunch of carbon dioxide. And the buildup of this carbon dioxide inside cells would be terrible. But carbon dioxide too, remember there's a central carbon uh, that is flanked on either side by oxygens, and the oxygen is pulling equally as hard on those electrons. So even carbon dioxide is a nonpolar molecule. So anything that is nonpolar, like oxygen or carbon dioxide or steroids for that matter, uh, can move across a membrane. So carbon dioxide we can see going from an area of high to low concentration. Let's label this our simple diffusion. We see it in a couple of places with oxygen and carbon dioxide. So, so things that are tiny and that don't have a charge. I will say this, uh, let me grab this, this uh, blue one and we'll let this represent water molecules. Uh, this water molecule crossing a the membrane. Uh, these can cross the membrane. They are polar, that is true, but they're also very tiny. So they are capable of crossing this membrane, but they, they do so kind of reluctantly. You may remember that I have mentioned some other, some actual plasma proteins that are called aquaporins. And you can, uh, you can add additional aquaporin proteins onto the membrane of a cell if you're wanting to increase the amount of oxygen that can move across the membrane. So cells can adjust how permeable they are to water molecules. I just wanted to point out that water molecules can cross the membrane on their own, but if we're going to be talking about water molecules crossing a membrane, we're going to mention that when we get to osmosis. I'm just trying to stress that things that are small and without a charge to them are going to be able to move across this membrane. Simple diffusion. 
Here is, once again, we can tell that it's diffusion because particles are going from an area of high concentration uh, down towards an area where there is less of them. So down the concentration gradient, that tells us this is passive transport, no energy is required. But what is required in this case is a protein facilitator. This is a particle that is too large. So regardless of whether or not it has a charge, it's too big to move, make it through our chain link fence or cross this membrane on its own. It needs some type of, of facilitator in the form of a protein. Many of these facilitators are like the door here. It's a gated channel. Uh, it's currently, like we can see here, it's currently closed, but we can change the position of the door and now it's open. So gated channels are going to be common, but we will also end up talking about what we will call leak channels. And these are channels that are constantly open. They remain open like a tube and things can just flow through them always down their concentration gradient from wherever there's more towards wherever there's less. And if I haven't mentioned it before, we're going to see there are specific proteins. Let's put a couple of them up here. Like we mentioned the GLUT proteins. That just stands for glucose transporter. And large things like glucose molecules can be surrounding cells. This is what happens with diabetics. Their cells are surrounded by all of this, this glucose. And the cell's starving. It's saying, feed me glucose. I need to get glucose in here. But there's no way to get glucose in the cell unless we've activated some of these glucose transporters. Most of the times, these glucose transporters are locked away inside vessels in the middle of a cell. And it has to, there's a chain of chemical reactions that take place involving insulin that lead to this glucose transporter getting stuck onto the membrane. Now it's active. Now it can come into contact with glucose uh, and allow glucose to move across that membrane and get into the cells. So we can see this is a, a form of facilitated diffusion. because we've got a protein allowing these particles to go from high to low concentration. There are also things like sodium channels that are going to be specific to, to sodium ions, and they'll let sodium move from an area of high concentration where there's a lot of it out here into an area where there's relatively little sodium. This is still passive, so we can label this as facilitated diffusion. So different facilitators are going to allow different particles to move across the membrane. Facilitated diffusion. Now we get into osmosis. And there, you know, this is kind of a complex looking slide, but let's, let's describe the setup real quick. The left hand side, we're looking at a U-shaped tube that has been filled with water. And then at the bottom of the tube, there's this little selective filter. It's basically half of our plasma membrane. It's the half that's selecting based off of size. This little filter isn't going to be able to separate based on charge, like our hydrophobic moat is going to be able to do. But you can see when we zoom in, if the, the molecules are small enough to fit through the openings, then they're going to be able to cross freely. Uh, but if they're too large, like these glucose molecules, they're going to be stuck on either side of this membrane. Here's where we're getting close to our lab results. We said something about this last time, that water molecules are always going to be drawn towards the side of a membrane wherever there's more solutes. And I created these things last time because we were saying water molecules are following around any of these particles dissolved in water. So a potassium ion, as it's moving around, is dragging with it two water molecules. Glucose is a larger molecule, so wherever a glucose molecule moves, it's going to be pulling water molecules with it. Since we have more glucose molecules on one side of this U-shaped tube, over here, uh, we're going to see that if we were to press play, and let this solution just sit there for a few minutes, the water molecules will start to be drawn over towards the side where there are more solutes. Again, that's why I just uh, created these little things so that you can see water molecules are drawn, to, drawn towards particles. They have a pulling force on these water molecules. This pulling force of pulling water towards this side of the tube is what we will describe as osmotic pressure. 
in the A and P class, we have to know hydrostatic pressure, which is a pushing force, the heart contracting, forcing blood through the vessels. Uh, that's a pushing force versus an osmotic pressure, a pulling force. That's really done by the solutes and they're pulling on these water molecules. We know that if we put a cell into a hypotonic solution, it's going to swell up. Again, because of the, the good tip that was shared last time, it's easy to remember hypotonic that cells are going to swell up like a spherical beach ball because the O right there in hypotonic kind of looks like a cell that's been put into a hypotonic solution uh, versus these cells that have shriveled up. You even uh, need that R for shriveled up, that hypertonic, the R in that hypertonic kind of looks like a cell that's shriveled up a little bit. So that is helpful. Uh, we talked about when to use hypertonic and hypotonic. I'm going to come back to that for just a second. What else? There is a short little video that I want to play that just shows a comparison of diffusion and osmosis. And I know we haven't written the definitions down, but maybe we'll go there next. Here we go. This just has some good music, but there's no words to it. So they've got this aquarium. They spread out water molecules evenly distributed. Uh, but then on one side, they've loaded it up with a bunch of glucose molecules. And we're going to see them just behave by diffusion. They're spreading out from high to low concentration. If they were crossing a membrane, then it would be membrane transport. It would be simple diffusion. They're just spreading out. Okay. So I like this one because it's the U-shaped tube that we just had set up, uh, except this is just an aquarium with a semi-permeable membrane in it, uh, and we're letting the two halves of the aquarium represent our U-shaped tube. And on one side, we're going to load it up with a bunch of glucose molecules, and then we're going to see the movement of water molecules, whether they, how they cross this membrane. And again, they are always drawn. One way that, that osmosis is described is that water molecules go from high to low concentration. That is true. Water molecules, as any passive transport, they're going to spread out from an area of high water molecule concentration towards an area of low water molecule concentration. But visually, watch this video. It's just easier to think of these water molecules as being drawn towards the side wherever there are more solutes. And you can see the difference in water levels. That's a measure of osmotic pressure. How many solutes are over here is going to contribute to how hard that, that osmotic pool is going to be. How much water is going to be drawn to the other side. So anyway, osmotic pressure is a pulling force. It has to do with water molecules drawn across a membrane to the side of wherever there are more solutes. This is coming back in our lab results in just a second. Okay. Back to this. Uh, we have talked about osmosis. We've even created solutions that are hypertonic and hypotonic, and I'll review those before we get into our lab results. But uh, let me mention the other half of this, which is the active transport. And let's see how we're doing on our list so far. I've got simple diffusion. We've got things that are nonpolar and don't need any kind of channel at all. We've got those crossing the membrane labeled as simple diffusion. Now we've got some particles that are crossing a membrane, but only with the help of some type of protein facilitator. So we've got facilitated diffusion. And now that we've seen our slide of osmosis, we can label this process of water molecules crossing a membrane. They're always going to be drawn towards the side of the membrane with higher solute concentration. Let's label this as osmosis. Specific to just those water molecules crossing. 
and it may take a second, but let's see if we can squeeze in these terms. Simple diffusion, it's going to sound a lot like how we defined just regular passive transport. In simple diffusion, you've got particles moving from a high to low concentration across a membrane. So I'll say particles uh, from high to low concentration. Maybe it would be better to say particles move from high to low concentration, and then I have to add across a membrane. We're talking about membrane transport here. So simple diffusion, it's as if they were tiny particles, like the mosquitoes that are capable of just flying right through our chain link fence from one side of the membrane to the next. That was different than facilitated diffusion. We still had particles moving from our room out into the hallway, but they were too large to just diffuse anywhere. They needed some type of facilitator like the door. So in facilitated diffusion, we're gonna once again say particles move from high to low concentration across a membrane. Particles move from high to low concentration across a membrane. So that's all the same, but the last bit here, particles move from high to low concentration across a membrane with the help of a protein facilitator. So I'll say with help of protein facilitator. So there has to be some type of channel. That is in contrast to osmosis, which is not just any particle. Osmosis instead is concerned with water molecules. So let's describe osmosis specifically as the movement of water molecules across the membrane. So movement of water molecules across a membrane I'll say from high to low concentration. Water molecules spread out. Again, visually, I think it's easier to think of these molecules as being drawn towards the side of the membrane wherever there are uh, the highest solute concentration. As far as primary uh, and secondary active transport, if we switch gear and think about active transport, these are going to be both cases where the ions or the particles in question are going to be pumped against their concentration gradient. We don't know what's going on here, but we can tell some particles are moving from an area of low concentration and being forced into an area where there's already a bunch of them. So we're going against our concentration gradient. This is like swimming upstream. It's only going to happen if there's lots of ATP being used up. So sure enough, we see ATP getting used up as these particles are pushed against their concentration gradient. Maybe the most common example is our sodium potassium pump. Let me get a different color. Maybe this color will work. And, uh, and right here, Well, I'll just draw it in a funny little shape. I'm going to label this uh, our sodium potassium pump. And like any pump, what this is going to be doing is it's going to be just burning through ATP. So ATP goes in and what comes out is the, the dead battery of ADP and an extra phosphate ion. So this pump is burning through ATP, and what it's doing as it burns through that ATP, we're going to see that it takes sodium ions, and it's going to throw three of these sodium ions to the outside, to the extracellular fluid. And at the same time, it's going to be bringing in two of these potassium ions. Every time this pump goes through its series of uh, shapes, we can see that it's taking potassium and throwing it to the inside of the cell and sodium and, and throwing that sodium to the outside of the cell. That might be more helpful if you have an idea of the relative concentrations of sodium inside the cell. Look right here. We can see that some sodium just can drift into this cell by way of facilitated diffusion. 
It's true, there's some sodium inside the cell, but if we think about sodium concentrations in this intracellular fluid, they're gonna be very low. So sodium is low in this intracellular fluid. Potassium levels are always going to be very high. And just so you know, there's uh, also inside the cell very low levels of calcium ions. And it's the opposite if we go just to the other side of the membrane. If we think about common ion concentrations in the extracellular fluid, we're going to see that sodium concentrations in the extracellular fluid are very high. And by contrast, potassium levels out here in the extracellular uh, fluid are going to be very low. I'll add the other one in here, which is uh, just for reference real quick. Calcium is also going to be very high out here in the extracellular fluid. It's very low inside. And, and you can see one of the things kind of creating that this, let's if we focus on one of those and just think about sodium, for example. There is lots of sodium outside the cell and very little sodium inside the cell. That's what allows sodium, like we said, just to diffuse by facilitated diffusion into the cell. But this sodium isn't gonna stay there very long because the sodium potassium pump, if it sees any sodium nearby, it's gonna take these sodiums and throw them outside. So you can see very quickly, we get this large buildup of sodium outside the cell and very little sodium inside. We're going against our concentration gradient with now there's just little sodium in here and lots of sodium outside we're only going to be able to continuously push sodium out if there is ATP being used. Okay, this is what we're calling primary active transport. Two things tell you that. Obviously the fact that we're going against the concentration gradient is one thing that tells you active transport. Primary active transport is because right there we can see that ATP is being used. Turns out before we get to the review slide, it turns out there's another type of active transport that does not use ATP, but instead relies on these co-transporters. Here's one example of those co-transporters. And I've got just enough room in here. Let me, uh, let me move the labeling of our plasma membrane. And what I'm gonna put in here, Try and grab a color that I haven't used. Maybe this orange color will work. This is going to represent one of our co-transporters. I'll just draw it as a circle. Uh, maybe this one can be our sodium calcium co-transporter. Uh, it's going to co-transport sodium and calcium and it's gonna be doing so using secondary active transport. So that means we're not gonna see this thing use ATP, but it's basically relying on the fact that this primary active transport has removed the sodium from in this cell. Since there's very low sodium in the cell, like we can see it's doing right over here, sodium can just fall into the cell. As long as this thing is constantly vacuuming out any sodium, keeping it really low inside the cell, sodium can fall into the cell. And right over here, if sodium falls into the cell, through this co-transporter, sodium comes in, and that's fine because the, the sodium potassium pump is gonna get rid of that sodium. But this is like those turning doors in the front of the hotel building. As sodium comes in, we're gonna see calcium comes out. Calcium, there's already a bunch of calcium out here. Calcium is going from low concentration towards high concentration. That's active transport. We're going against our concentration gradient, but this isn't using ATP to do so. The ATP was used back there to create this concentration gradient of low sodium inside. And this co-transporter is relying on sodium falling in to get rid of additional calcium. So the cell membrane can have these proteins that are capable of doing these co-transporting tricks. We'll see the same thing happen with uh, sodium and glucose in the kidneys. Hopefully my head's not in the way there. Let's look at the pictures that we have. I know we've just seen a lot of these, but this first picture should be screaming to you simple diffusion, right? It's, it's simple diffusion because there's no proteins that are involved. These particles are crossing that membrane anywhere they want to, just like oxygen or carbon dioxide are, are behaving in our sketch. 
Then we can see things like glucose or these charged particles like sodium ions. They need some type of protein channel either due to their size being too large or due to their charge. So these are, uh, this would be facilitated transport. Some of these facilitators are open channels, other ones are gated channels. And then finally we can see active transport. We, we can tell particles are going against their concentration gradient. It looks like these doesn't even tell us what they are, sodium or potassium. These are being thrown into an area where there's already a lot of them. So that tells us active transport and then we can see ATP is being used. That has to be primary active transport. Okay, one of the last things is how large substances get in and out of the cell. Uh, to use my fence analogy, if this was still a chain link fence, I mean, if we're a mosquito, we can fly through it, no problem. But if it's us, we got to go through one of the doors. Uh, instead of, of us, maybe, maybe let's think if we had like a big grand piano in here, and now we've got to move that grand piano out in the hallway. It's not fitting through the door, so we're going to have to take out a section of the wall. And luckily the membrane is much more flexible than this wall would be. And we can see that the membrane itself can form these little pockets and it can pinch off substances that it can catch along the surface of a cell. This is known as endocytosis. Things are being brought into the cell. If it is a solid substance, like a food particle, this engulfing of a solid stuff substance is called phagocytosis. Whereas uh, if, if this thing that was engulfed was a fluid, if it was liquid, it would be referred to as pinocytosis. Both phagocytosis and pinocytosis are forms of endocytosis, bringing large things into the cell. The opposite of that would be exocytosis. And uh, if we haven't mentioned it already, there are some cells in the pancreas whose job it is to produce insulin. Insulin is a big protein. And it's released in bulk from these cells in the pancreas. And this is a process of some of those vessels that have just left the Golgi body and they have their proteins in their final functional shape. And, and these proteins are packaged in a vessel made out of plasma membrane. It merges with our, our surface membrane, the exterior plasma membrane, and we can see uh, deposits all of its products out into the extracellular fluid. So bulk exocytosis is occurring here. And that's the last slide. Let me show this little brief video of the same things there, just in a moving variety. And the other side of this, we'll take our short little break and then I'll set up the lab stuff. The substances taken in by single-celled organisms are often particles or large polar molecules that cannot cross the hydrophobic plasma membrane. Many single-celled eukaryotes employ endocytosis to ingest such food particles. In this process, the plasma membrane extends outward and surrounds the food particle. Cells use three major types of endocytosis, phagocytosis, pinocytosis, and receptor-mediated endocytosis. If the material the cell takes in is particulate, such as a bacterium or a fragment of organic matter, the process is called phagocytosis. If the material the cell takes in is liquid, it is called pinocytosis. Specific molecules, such as low-density lipoproteins, LDL, are often transported into eukaryotic cells through receptor-mediated endocytosis. Molecules to be transported first bind to specific receptors on the plasma membrane. The interior portion of the receptor protein is embedded in the membrane. The protein clathrin coats the inside of the membrane in the area of the pit. When an appropriate collection of molecules gathers in the coated pit, the pit deepens and seals off to form a coated vesicle which carries the molecules into the cell. Exocytosis is the reverse of endocytosis. This process results in the discharge of material from vesicles at the cell surface to the outside of the cell. Okay, good enough. Okay, we did something like this where uh, 
that works. We had three beakers, and I use that term loosely because all I did was get some plastic cups. And we just put different stuff. We labeled one uh, beaker one, let's label this beaker two, and beaker three. Even though they were plastic cups. And uh, to give us some type of measurement on there, I added a fill line to each of our cups that showed us that we were putting the same volume of fluid. It was 300 milliliters in each cup. Uh, and remember the first beaker we said got just water. So it was 100% water and, uh, and it was 0% glucose. It got none of the corn syrup. Then the second beaker, we said it also had 300 milliliters of fluid in it, but 30% of that was glucose, 70% was water. So we had a 30% glucose solution, and, and that was apparent, not that we could see the glucose dissolve, but there, there were particles dissolved because we, we had 30% glucose floating around in here. But beaker three had 70% glucose so it was mostly glucose and only 30% water. So that looked something like this, where there was just many more solutes floating around into this beaker. And you even, I heard some people talking about when they were stirring this up, you could just feel that it was much more viscous because it was so saturated with, with glucose molecules. Uh, okay, so this is, this is how we have it set up over there. And, and we even have these labeled as, um, like when we were done with them, we were able to label them as hypertonic, hypotonic, and isotonic. But, but right now, all by itself, could we call this solution hypertonic or hypotonic? No, because it was always a comparison. Those terms, tonicity, refers to the extracellular fluid, the, the solute concentration of extracellular fluid. So before we call these things hypertonic or hypotonic, we could put a measure on these solutions for osmolarity. Osmolarity told us a, a measure of solute concentration. So this uh, solution had zero solutes floating around in it. So it had zero milliosmoles if we wanted to put a measure of osmolarity on it. This one and beaker number two, it had some solutes in there, about 30% glucose. I'm going to estimate that and say 300 milliosmoles. You know, it, it's not nothing, but it's not as much as beaker three. This had 70% glucose. So if we put a number of, in terms of milliosmoles to this, it's going to be much higher than beaker number two would be. So we can put a number of osmolarity on there. But that doesn't tell us alone if it's hypertonic, hypotonic, or isotonic. How we figured that out was comparing it to our egg. So that's where uh, each egg came in. You had three eggs per group, and each egg, like any normal cell, is going to have a certain number of solutes inside, and we can put a measure to that. We said it was about 300 milliosmoles. So you had three eggs, each were about 300 milliosmoles, and we dropped an egg into each one of these beakers. And now we have a comparison point. We've got 300 milliosmoles. I'll just put 300 in there. 300 milliosmoles, and that is telling us a measure of solutes floating around in there. Now, uh, now that we have an egg in beaker number one, we can use those terms hypertonic, hypotonic, or isotonic to refer to this extracellular fluid. We've got the fluid inside the cell and now this fluid outside the cell. How would we describe this extracellular fluid in beaker one? Hypotonic. Remember, hypo is below and tonic is solute concentration of the extracellular fluid. So that extracellular fluid has fewer solutes in it than the cell would. 
right? And then we, we can also see what direction water is going to move in a hypotonic solution. It's always drawn towards the side of the membrane wherever there is more solutes. So this cell is going to swell in a hypotonic solution. And after we submerge our egg in beaker number three, we can see it's got 300 milliosmoles in there, but there are way more solutes surrounding this cell. So the extracellular fluid in beaker number three, we would describe as hypertonic. Hyper is above. And again, tonicity is solute concentration of that extracellular fluid. So there's more solutes in the extracellular fluid in beaker number three. So you would expect water to be drawn out of the cell. Again, towards the side of the membrane, wherever there is more solutes. And then in the middle, we've got our isotonic solution which was about 300 milliosmoles to start with. So when we put a cell that also has about 300 milliosmoles of solute in it, you wouldn't expect to see any net movement of water. It is true that some water molecules may wander in there, but at the same rate, water molecules are gonna wander out. So there is no net movement of water when we look at a cell in an isotonic solution. So iso is just the same and tonicity still is solute concentration of extracellular fluid.